<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome back to KubeCon Cloud Native Con here in the wonderful city of Chicago. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with my co-host John Furrier. We are ripping through the morning. It's been really exciting and I'm pumped for our next conversation. Before we get there, John, what's your highlight of the morning so far? Um, so far the interviews have been amazing. We've had Red Hat top people come on. I love the edge conversation. Sally from Red Hat is so smart. What a firecracker, I right? love the operating system angle and, and the combination of data uh, operating system concepts, platform engineering, and how to use data with the AI wave over the top makes this the perfect storm of innovation happening. Of all the KubeCons I've been to, Savannah, this is probably the one that's kind of clear in the runway Ooh, on the cruising altitude would agree to with get you. into the clouds, if you will. So I think- It's going to get real punny today. I, I, think, I think it's really a good metrization of the ecosystem, and uh, even with the economic climate the way it is, the AI wave and the booths here showing signs of just non-stop growth. I mean, I think it's going to be a great, great day. So I, I couldn't agree more, and I actually want to start by talking about the booths. First of all, welcome, Daniel. Hi. Thank you so much for being here from MinIO, our friends. Thank you you for guys are always me. on the show, actually. I feel like anytime we're in the same space, we yeah. always invite you, because you're also interesting. You and I were chatting about mm -hmm. your booth and what yes. it's like hanging out. We've noticed the buzz and the energy in the room. You were saying that there's a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the energy. What are some of the conversations that you're having? So that, that's, it's really inspiring to see all these people coming to our booth and saying, hey, I've tried your stuff. Right, because a common story of how actually Minio gets adopted into companies is usually starts with the developers. They start like, okay, I run Minio on my laptop, it worked, this is great. Maybe I can take this to production, right? So they just deploy it as another application in their cloud native environment, and it just works. And slowly starts creeping into the organization, right? This is where the shadow IT is, is kind of like bringing what they need, uh, that it's so, uh, that's a bit of software defined. Right, mm -hmm. so they come and tell us these stories of, of success and we're very excited and sometimes they even come with their technical questions so we're providing free customer support on the spot. So yeah. it's been quite- <laughs> It's a win-win for everyone. It's a win-win for everyone, it's definitely, yeah. <laughs> for everyone coming by your booth. Is there a, a customer use case or anything that you've learned about at the show this year that you didn't know about previously or something that surprised you or maybe inspired you a little extra? No, but we're, we're seeing more, more of the same topics that we've seen, been seeing over the past year, right? With, with uh, the nascent uh, ascent of AI. We're seeing all these AI data lakes, and so they're coming with all these uh, use cases and telling us, you know, we are now running these edge MinIO yeah. clusters because we are training on the cloud, right? So we're, we, we have our data on our own data center, right? Uh, they massive data lakes because now they want all this data sitting in one, sp in one spot so that AI can leverage it. When it comes to training, they want to leverage the cloud GPUs. Right, so they're spinning these GPH clusters and they're telling us all these gorgeous uh, use cases that we were like, okay, that's a great, great creative way of using MinIO. So we're very happy here in those cases. You mentioned data lakes. How important are data lakes right now? They're crazy important because yeah. the industry has been coming from this trend of, I have a, a storage technology for this data set, I have another storage technology for this other data set, but now it makes more sense to consolidate that into a single data lake, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where uh, object storage being primary storage is actually shining. So because com companies are finding out this is cheaper and easier, we just have all the data in one place, and then we just start leveraging to our AI tools, our big data analytics tools. How's the AI wave impacting you? Since we last talked, we were at the Open Source Summit in Vancouver, mm -hmm. we have a great chat. AI is continuing to surge in terms of the value of the data. Mm -hmm. You guys are in that business, storing yeah. unstructured data of Kubernetes. What's the, been the, the revelation since then mm -hmm. with how AI is changing the value mm -hmm. that you guys can extract from the data and customers? So we've been sur pleasingly surprised to see that we were in the right spot at the right time, preparing over years, you know, making sure every single uh, machine learning framework supported object storage natively, right? So no now that AI is coming along and the AI needs to leverage massive amounts of data, right? They need to train at very high speed. Only object storage can deliver that, right? There's nothing that traditional storage can deliver, especially at the scale that the these data sets are coming for AI. So we were surprisingly in the right spot at the right time. Yeah. So we are actually being delighted by now okay. the industry waking up and noticing oh, you know, we actually need to embrace object storage because that's the object storage of the cloud. It's a, it's a great example of being in the arena, doing the work, mm -hmm. being at the right time, <laughs> yes. when the wave hits. Now, what kind of value are you guys extracting from that data? Because this is a great, again, one of the best use cases we're seeing in business right now is getting value out of the data. Mm -hmm. What kind of value you guys see extracted from this? So, that, that, that's very interesting because, uh, at least from the customers that, I, that we're seeing, is most of them, like 80% of the data is machine generated data, unstructured data, right? And companies like keeping this data around because right now they don't know what to do with it, but eventually they're like, oh, I 
I want to go back and figure out this metric or figure out this insight from this data. And now it's even possible if, you, if they kept all that data in their data lake. And now they have LLMs to go and, okay, go analyze through all these logs at very high speed. I need the, the storage to be able to string me this, right? So the LLM can be telling me, the LLMs can do amazing things now on this unstructured data. They can be like, and read the log and be like, something that no human will have anticipated before. Like, this log is sneakily trying to do something you were not anticipating, right? So it's very important uh, to keep all this data on a single one place. So now these technologies are actually making the data shine. So, so one of the things we're preparing for Savannah, SuperCloud 5 in our studio coming up, that brings up the whole multiple environment and conversation. You got reInvent coming up, show, you got Microsoft Ignite, OpenAI just had their demo day on Monday, yeah. which I mean, is very inspiring. Supercomputing next week. Supercomputing yeah. next week, so yeah. chip innovation, uh, model innovation with OpenAI is sort of the inspiration. It felt like a Mac-like event, people clapping and cheering. Um, not your typical boring keynote, but it was really strong. Microsoft's going to have to get a tailwind with their products. Yeah. AWS is going to probably launch a boatload of new things. Mm -hmm. The cloud guys are coming in. The open source community is growing like a weed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And open oh, how <laughs> how do you see this market? What's your what's your take on this? Because you're in the middle of all the action. Mm -hmm. How does it all come together? What's the, what's the AI impact? So this is where the trending that we were seeing people going to hi the hybrid cloud model, right? Because Kubernetes is enabling this insane portability into like, now I don't need to struggle into deploying the same application on-premise or on this cloud provider or on this other cloud provider. So now I was mentioning, now that people are like, okay, I have this data on this location, but I need a compute, right? Because right now the compute is a scarce resource. I need those GPU accelerators, these tensor processing units. So now I need to be able to quickly spin up a storage on this different cloud provider, but how can I do it? Should I rewrite my code to be like uh, locking, uh, locking with a vendor? Or can I just use the same API, right? And this is where Minayo is actually being, being so portable, entirely software defined, it's, it's actually making us really embrace this trend of uh, when people need to go and embrace a big player, because let's say, this one cloud has all the GPUs right now. So I'm going to go and crunch my, my models on this cloud, right? So, but I want the same API. So when I tear down this compute cluster and I go to the next cloud provider, right? I can spin it up again and keep, keep it my data in a consistent fashion. I don't need to update my algorithms or anything. You've been with the team for over four years. Yeah. We're now kind of potentially at peak hype curve for AI. Mm -hmm. When you started at Minio, did you think that you would be a part of the solution for AI at that time? You know, you know, that's a very interesting way to put it because even before I joined MinIO, on my previous startup, I was head of machine learning and I was doing all the machine learning locally on top of MinIO, right? Oh my, oh, so that makes sense. Now yes. we know a little bit of the origin story yes, there. No, I love that, yeah. It was, it was the right way like to build all the Spark pipelines that we were building, all the TensorFlow algorithms that we were training on. They was all on top of object storage yeah. every time because I knew there's no way these data sets that we're using, we can just keep shuffling them around. Or even when you're developing as a, as a machine learning engineer, Pulling the data set just to test if an algorithm is going to work is really slow. So it's better if you can actually use it locally, right? So yeah. I was already like a big Minayo fan. <laughs> so being, joining the Minayo team just made it even better. <laughs> so. I, I, okay. I, what a I, genuine I, endorsement. I <laughs> love that. That was great. I told you, Savannah, he's a high bandwidth conversation here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can warn me he was smart. <laughs> okay. So, so I got to ask you. So what's your position vis-a-vis -vis neural network versus mm -hmm. probabilistic LLMs? Mm -hmm. Large language models with hallucinations, a feature, not a bug, and then mm -hmm. the power law that we published around specialized models coming in. So you got mm -hmm. the models have big, fat ones, then the long tail comes in, specialized models, mm -hmm. but then neural networks is a different architecture combination yeah. than great, say great the other point. Question. So how do you see that coming together? So what, what, it's very interesting because LLMs came to change the landscape one more time, right? So, and you see these two strategies emerging in the LLM market space, right? You see Meta being like, okay, I'm going to go capture all the developers by bringing all these LLMs so that, you know, experienced engineers can go and build amazing apps on top of that. And these are the kind of engineers that are really familiar with neural networks and they can connect them, right? So the language model will solve some of the problems that I had and I'll, I'll build my domain specific solution on top of a neural network and interface them. Yeah. Because LLMs have a unique advantage in that sense. And then on the other side, you see OpenAI being like, okay, I'll, bring, I'll, I'll grab everyone else that's non-technical, right? Mm -hmm. I'll let them build GPTs now with natural language. And these are all people who want to get into the, the party, the AI party, but they don't have the technical know-how. That low-code, no-code, no code, yeah. Yes. They and democratize now, the AI. Yes. All right, so then the next question is, okay, what happens next uh, in the infrastructure? Because again, this, we're in Kubernetes land here, so mm -hmm. this is all moving to a distributed environment. We talk about the operating system. It'll go there, it'll be all self-driving, mm -hmm. it'll all be self-buildable with AI. 
but AI itself, in a way, needs its own operating system. Like, if you look at what neural networks are, mm -hmm. and LLMs with data, and storage relationship that you're talking about, you can almost pontificate this idea of, isn't there like a, maybe a new operating AI mm -hmm. system? Yeah. That's completely so, different. So I see object storage as the operative system of AI because pretty much the data sets are in object storage. The models end up being in object storage, right? And when you start serving them, you may actually be spinning hundreds of servings for, uh, servers for inference and all these servers are pulling their, their, their model from object storage, right? So it's the one uh, part that actually makes it simple because today you're building your models on TensorFlow, tomorrow you may start building it on PyTorch and you don't know what framework might come af after that, right? But then the, what, what remains constant is your data and your models, right? So that I see object storage being portable in across all different kinds of uh, cloud infrastructure being that, that one operating okay, system. Okay, so this now multi-cloud moves to a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. What's that use case for multi-cloud? You got latency, mm -hmm. you're going to have have data layer in there, yeah. you're going to have to have compute, TPUs, GPUs, CPUs. Yeah. How do you see that? Because that's what people are working on right now. Okay, if I can go to Azure and get some of their GPUs, yeah. or Google and they got TPUs, yeah. how do I write a programmatic, so scalable system? That, that's what I, the, one of the use cases that I was amazed by seeing, uh, listening in the booth. This company is spinning up these edge clusters, so I'm caching all the data on MinIO, the data sets, because now they're going to do the, this large scale training on Azure, right? And they were, I was like, that's brilliant. And then at the, at the end of the training, this means that every time they need a file for the data set to train, they just load it once into their edge, and they just train like crazy. And at the end of the training, they just destroy everything, and then, yeah, it's like nothing ever happened, they have the model and they bring it back home. And then you start serving inference on top of that. So with this is these very creative use cases, right? We saw that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, we saw that starting with, with the self-driving cars, right? They were running Minayo in the trunk, right? <laughs> and then the car is recording all these sensor data, yeah. bring it back into the garage and then copying that into their local edge cluster, and then the edge cluster bringing it into the cloud. So we've seen this trend coming from the years where people mm -hmm. really need uh, versatility from software-defined storage, right? And software-defined storage is pretty much object storage. So the intelligent well edge goes a whole nother level. Yes. So obviously Minayo providing a lot of solutions for customers on the floor here and people around the world. What's next for y'all? So right now, because we're a company that releases every single week, so we are always working on top of every the- Every single week is strong, by the way. I just want to give that a moment. Releasing <laughs> every week is bold. I love yes, that. Thank you very much. Moving as fast as your customers want to move. That's the spirit. And that's, yeah. and that's the thing. Every time yeah. we fix a problem for one customer, it benefits everyone. Right. right? And that's how we like it. So but right now, people are asking us, oh, why are you guys announcing at KubeCon? Well, you know, we, since we release every week, every time there's a new feature, it just goes in the, new, in the next week. You're making release. an announcement every week. You don't need to wait for events like this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we did have a big announcement in Barcelona at VMworld where we explored, uh, we, we show how now the new data services uh, include MinIO. So now you can actually launch MinIO from vCenter itself. And so a large, very large cluster for big data. But uh, regarding uh, what, what's next for us, we're, we're bringing a, a set of new pr products to actually simplify the operation of object storage on the edge and on different uh, uh, models. That is actually very exciting. And when we're ready to show it, we'll, we'll start showing it. Cool, we can't wait to see it. Daniel, you. you're like a master class here on theCUBE. Really appreciate you. Um, question for people watching. How should they think about preparing their data sets um, they got models, they got their data, that's clear it's a competitive advantage to have good data. Clean data makes AI better, obviously. What advice, what best practices, what have you observed Great question. as mm -hmm. a way for people to start rethinking around how do I organize myself, my, whether it's my data or how do I look into the models? Mm -hmm. what, what's, what are some areas you could recommend to start thinking about? Well, what in my experience, what I've seen is that uh, not a lot of companies go the extra mile into pre-processing their data properly. They they waste a lot of a lot of like they spin up the GPU instances and then they spin spend time pre-processing the data just to fit it into the GPU. Whereas they could have a stage just to pre-process data properly and put it in object storage and then speed up training because object storage can let you read the data as fast as the GPU can pull it. So you definitely want to be in a position where when you're going to be spinning up this expensive hardware, you're ready to go, right? So that, that's probably the, the, the biggest uh, advice I would give people when running machine learning pipelines, to properly structure them so that when you're about to start a particular stage, if it's training or just serving, you have everything ready. 
Talk about vector databases. Why is that so important? Why is it such the rage? Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see everyone come out with their own vector database. Mm -hmm. And it's a, we've said on theCUBE, it's a feature, not a company. But, yep. but people are putting vector databases and embeddings next to data stores. Mm -hmm. What's your view on that? Why is it important? And how do you guys look at this new vectorization of these new embeddings? So, vector databases exploded in popularity, especially with large language models, because you have these large, very large amounts of data on structure and structure, and you need to figure out a way to actually retrieve it, uh, uh, retrieve it without knowing what you're looking for, right? This is where vectors come into place and encode the data, but you know, these are very large vectors, right? So very large vectors, and pretty much you, you, need, uh, you, you need a place to actually uh, place this, uh, this vector, back, back them about these indices, right? So you'll, you'll see this trend where most vector databases out there, they're built with MinIO in mind, right? Or backing up to object storage. And, but we see this trend because now there are companies are actually, okay, let me load these 10 years of logs, right? And then I need to find that needle in the haystack with an LLM, an LLM makes it trivial to find that needle in the haystack. So now, but you need to have all those logs into a vectorized format because pretty much you're not looking for words, you're looking for concepts, and a vector database or a vector representation of an information makes that trivial. Awesome. Uh, can we have him explain all of the complex uh, <laughs> ideas here What's, on theCUBE? What is Kubernetes? No, you, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's how Doesn't I ended up anymore. here. That's how I ended up here, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> no, that was, that was great. Daniel, wow, you are just full of insight and such a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you for having me. We're looking forward to your happy hour tonight. Thank yeah. you for always bringing the fun and the education to theCUBE. John, thanks for the great questions. What an insightful session this just was. Oh, fantastic. Yes. So I, I just have one question, and maybe the audience will appreciate I ask this. Yes. Uh, Aren't those uh, <laughs> earrings heavy? <laughs> uh, you know, they're not, they're not too heavy. They're, they're here, I'll let you feel. They're, they are an actual small uh, Rubik's Cube, so you can see. Okay, oh, they're actually pretty light. Yeah, yeah, show the yes. audience. You can give it a little uh, twirl. Yeah, yeah, yeah light. No, actually, it works. Yeah. They're, they're just mini cubes turned into. You can solve it right there. That one hasn't uh, been solved. Yeah, 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 the other one hasn't been solved. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure not to. I love this. No, I don't mind. I certainly <laughs> don't mind. Well, I love it. Daniel will bring his his Rubik's Cube skills to our, our next session, maybe at SuperCloud 5, yeah. just named the Battle for AI Supremacy. Very excited for that coming up, and always excited for continuous conversations with MinIO. My name is Savannah Peterson. We're here in Chicago at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. Thank you for tuning in to theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news. Yeah.